Chapter 4, Part 2 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Count von Zeppelin, Part 2. The worrisome work of begging began again, but this time the Kaiser's aid was even more effectively given, and in nine months Zeppelin III was in the air. More powerful than its predecessors, it met with a greater measure of success. On one of its trials, a propeller blade flew off and penetrated the envelope, but the ship returned to Earth in safety. In October 1906, the Minister of War reported that the airship was extremely stable, responded readily to her helm, had carried 11 persons 67 miles in 2 hours and 17 minutes, and had made its landing in ease and safety. Accepted by the government, Number 3 passed into military service, and Zeppelin, now the idol of the German people, began the construction of Number 4. That ship was larger than her predecessors, and carried a third cabin for passengers suspended amidships. Marked increase in the size of the steering and stabling planes characterized the appearance of the ship when compared with earlier types. She was at the outset a lucky ship. She cruised through alpine passes into Switzerland, and made a circular voyage carrying eleven passengers and flying from Frederikshavn to Mayence, and back via Basel strasbourg mannheim and stuttgart the voyage occupied twenty-one hours a world's record the performance of the ship on both voyages was perfection even in the tortuous alpine passes which she was forced to navigate on her trip to lucerne she moved with the steadiness and certainty of a great ship at sea the rarefication of the air at high altitudes the extreme and sudden variations in temperature the gusts of wind that poured from the ice-bound peaks down through the narrow canyons affected her not at all when to this experience was added the triumphant tour of the six german cities count von zeppelin might well have thought his triumph was complete but once again the cup of victory was dashed from his lips after his landing a violent wind beat upon the ship an army of men strove to hold her fast while an effort was made to reduce her bulk by deflation that effort which would have been entirely successful in the case of a non-rigid balloon was obviously futile in that of a zeppelin not the gas in the ballonets but the great rigid frame covered with waterproof cloth constituted the huge bulk that made her the plaything of the winds in a trice she was snatched from the hands of her crew and hurled against the trees in a neighboring grove there was a sudden and utterly unexpected explosion and the whole fabric was in flames the precise cause of the explosion will always be in doubt but as already pointed out many scientists believe that the great volume of electricity accumulated in the metallic frame was suddenly released in a mighty spark which set fire to the stores of gasoline on board with the disaster, the iron nerve of the inventor was for the first time broken. It followed so fast upon what appeared to be a complete triumph that the shock was peculiarly hard to bear. It is said that he broke down and wept, and that but for the loving courage and earnest entreaties of his wife and daughter, he would then have abandoned the hope and ambition of his life. But after all, it was but that darkest hour which comes just before the dawn the demolition of number four had been no accident which reflected at all upon the plan or construction of the craft unless the great bulk of the ship be considered a fundamental defect what it did demonstrate was that the zeppelin like the one thousand foot ocean liner must have adequate harbor and docking facilities wherever it is to land the one cannot safely drop down in any convenient meadow any more than the other can put into any little fishing port germany has learned this lesson well enough and since the opening of the great war her territory is plentifully provided with zeppelin shelters at all strategic points fortunately for the count the german people judged his latest reverse more justly than he did they saw the completeness of the triumph which had preceded the disaster and recognized that the latter was one easily guarded against in future enthusiasm ran high all over the land begging was no longer necessary the emperor who had heretofore expressed rather guarded approval of the enterprise now flung himself into it with that enthusiasm for which he is notable
he bestowed upon the count the order of the black eagle embraced him in public three times and called aloud that all might hear long life to his excellency count zeppelin the conqueror of the air he never wearied of assuring his hearers that the count was the greatest german of the century with such august patronage the count became the rage next to the kaisers the face best known to the people of germany through pictures and statues was that of the inventor of the zeppelin the pleasing practice of showing affection for a public man by driving nails into his wooden effigy had not then been invented by the poetic teutons else von zeppelin would have outdone von hindenburg in weight of metal the story that zeppelin had refused repeated offers from other governments was widely publicized and evoked patriotic enthusiasm with it went shrewd hints that in these powerful aircraft lay the way to overcome the hated english navy and even to carry war to the very soil of england it was then eight years before the greatest war of history was to break out but even at that date hatred of england was being sedulously cultivated among the german people by those in authority as a result of this national attitude count zeppelin's enterprise was speedily put on a sound financial footing though number four had been destroyed by an accident it had been the purpose of the government to buy her and one hundred twenty five thousand dollars of the purchase price was now put at the disposal of the count von zeppelin a popular zeppelin fund of one million five hundred thousand dollars was raised and expended in building great works thenceforward there was no lack of money for furthering what had truly become a great national interest but the progress of the construction of zeppelins for the next few years was curiously compounded of success and failure fate seemed to have decreed to every zeppelin triumph a disaster each mischance was attributed to exceptional conditions which never could happen again but either they did occur or some new but equally effective accident did outside of germany where the public mind had become set in an almost idolatrous confidence in zeppelin the great airships were becoming a jest and a byword notwithstanding their unquestioned accomplishments indeed when the record was made up just before the declaration of war in nineteen fourteen it was found that of twenty-five zeppelins thus far constructed only twelve were available thirteen had been destroyed by accident two of them modern naval airships only completed in 1913. The record was not one to inspire confidence. In 1909, during a voyage in which he made 900 miles in 38 hours, the rumor was spread that von Zeppelin would continue it to Berlin. Some joker sent a forged telegram to the Kaiser to that effect, signed Zeppelin. It was expected to be the first appearance of one of the great ships at the capital, and the emperor hastened to prepare a suitable welcome a great crowd assembled at the tempelhof parade ground the berlin airship battalion was under orders to assist in the landing the kaiser himself was ready to hasten to the spot should the ship be sighted but she never appeared if von zeppelin knew of the exploit which rumor had assigned to him which is doubtful he could not have carried it out his ship collided with a tree an accident singularly frequent in the zeppelin records so disabling it that it could only limp home under half power a rather curt telegram from his imperial master is said to have been count von zeppelin's first intimation that he had broken an engagement however he kept it two months later flying to berlin a distance of four hundred seventy five miles he was greeted with mad enthusiasm and among the crowd to welcome him was orville wright the american aviator it is a curious coincidence that on the day the writer pens these words the new york newspapers contain accounts of mr wright's proffer of his services and aeronautical facilities to the president in case an existing diplomatic break with germany should reach the point of actual war Mr. Wright accompanied his proffer by an appeal for a tremendous aviation force. But, said he, I strongly advise against spending any money whatsoever on dirigible balloons of any sort. Thereafter, the progress of Count von Zeppelin was without interruption for any lack of financial strength. His great works at Frederickshaven expanded until they were capable of putting out a complete ship in eight weeks he was building of course primarily for war and never concealed the fact that the enemy he expected to be the target of his bomb throwers was england 
What the airships accomplished in this direction, how greatly they were developed, and the strength and weakness of the German air fleet will be dwelt upon in another chapter. But, though building primarily for military purposes, Zeppelin did not wholly neglect the possibilities of his ship for non-military service. He built one which made more than 30 trips between Munich and Berlin, carrying passengers who paid a heavy fee for the privilege of enjoying this novel form of travel. The car was fitted up like our most up-to-date Pullmans, with comfortable seats, bright lights, and a kitchen from which excellent meals were served to the passengers. The service was not continued long enough to determine whether it could ever be made commercially profitable, but as an aid to firing the Teutonic heart and an assistance in selling stock, it was well worth while. The spectacle of one of these great cars, 600 or more feet long, floating grandly on even keel and with a steady course above one of the compact little towns of South Germany, was one to thrill the pulses but the ill luck which pursued count von zeppelin even in what seemed to be his moments of assured success was remorseless in nineteen twelve he produced the monster l1 five hundred twenty five feet long fifty feet in diameter of seven hundred seventy six thousand nine hundred cubic feet capacity and equipped with three sets of motors giving it a speed of fifty two miles an hour this ship was designed for naval use and after several successful cross-country voyages, she was ordered to Heligoland to participate in naval maneuvers with the fleet there stationed. One day, caught by a sudden gust of wind, such as are common enough on the North Sea, she proved utterly helpless. Why, no man could tell, her commander being drowned, but in the face of the gale she lost all control, was buffeted by the elements at their will, and dropped into the sea where she was a total loss. Fifteen of her twenty-two officers and men were drowned. The accident was the more inexplicable because the craft had been flying steadily over land for nearly twelve months and had covered more miles than any ship of Zeppelin construction. It was reported that her captain had said she was overloaded and that he feared that she would be helpless in a gale but after the disaster his mouth was stopped by the waters of the north sea this calamity was not permitted long to stand alone indeed one of the most curious facts about the zeppelin record is the regular periodical recurrence of fatal accidents at almost equal intervals and apparently wholly unaffected by the growing perfection of the airships while L-1 was making her successful cross-country flights, L-2 was reaching completion at Frederickshaven. She was shorter but bulkier than her immediate predecessor and carried engines giving her 900 horsepower, or 400 more than L-1. On its first official trip, the ship exploded a thousand feet in air, killing 28 officers and men aboard, including all the officials who were conducting the trials. The calamity, as exclaimed on an earlier page, was due to the accumulation of gas in the communicating passage between the three cars. This new disaster left the faith and loyalty of the German people unshaken, but it did decidedly estrange the scientific world from Count von Zeppelin and all his works. It was pointed out, with truth, that the accident paralleled precisely one which had demolished the Severo Pox airship ten years earlier, and which had caused French inventors to establish a hard and fast rule against incorporating in an airship design any enclosed space in which waste gas might gather. This rule and its reason were known to Count von Zeppelin, and by ignoring both he lent new color to the charge, already current in scientific circles, that he was loath to profit by the experiences of other inventors. Whether this feeling spread to the German government, it is impossible to say, nor is it easy to estimate how much official confidence was shaken by it. The government, even before the war, was singularly reticent about the Zeppelins, their numbers and plans. It is certain that orders were not withheld from the Count. Great numbers of his machines were built, especially after the war was entered upon, but he was not permitted longer to have a monopoly of government aid for manufacturers of dirigibles. Other types sprung up, notably the Schutt Lands, the Gross, and the Parseval, but being first in the field, the Zeppelin came to give its name to all the dirigibles of German make, and many of the famous, or infamous, exploits credited to it during the war may in fact have been performed by one of its rivals. 
it would be futile to attempt to enumerate all these rivals here among them are the semi-rigid parseval and gross types which found great favor among the military authorities during the war the latter is merely an adaptation of the highly successful french ship the lobaudi but the parseval is the result of a slow evolution from an ordinary balloon it is wholly german in conception and development and it is reported that the kaiser secretly disgusted that the zeppelins to the advancement of which he had given such powerful aid should have recorded so many disasters quietly transferred his interest to the new and simpler model despite the hope of a more efficient craft however both the gross and the parseval failed in their first official trials though later they made good the latter ship was absolutely without any wooden or metallic structure to give her rigidity two air ballonets were contained in the envelope at bow and stern and the ascent and descent of the ship was regulated by the quantity of air pumped into these a most curious device was the utilization of heavy cloth for the propeller blades limp and flaccid when at rest heavy weights in the hem of the cloth caused these blades to stand out stiff and rigid as the result of the centrifugal force created by their rapid revolution one great military advantage of the parseval was that she could be quickly deflated in the presence of danger at her moorings and wholly knocked down and packed in small compass for shipment by rail in case of need to neither of these models did there ever come such a succession of disasters as befell the earlier zeppelins it is fair to say however that prior to the war not many of them had been built and that both their builders and navigators had opportunity to learn from count von zeppelin's errors among the chief german rivals to the zeppelin is the schut lanz of the rigid type broader but not so long as the zeppelin framed of wood bound with wire and planned to carry a load of five or six tons or as many as thirty passengers number one of this type met its fate as did so many zeppelins by encountering a storm while improperly moored called to earth to replenish its supply of gas it was moored to an anchor sunk six feet in the ground and as an additional precaution three hundred soldiers were called from a neighboring barracks to handle it it seems to have been one of the advantages of germany as a place in which to maneuver dirigibles that even in time of peace there were always several hundred soldiers available wherever a ship might land but this force was inadequate a violent gust tore the ship from their hands one poor fellow instinctively clung to his rope until one thousand feet in the air when he let go the ship itself hovered over the town for an hour or more then descended and was dashed to pieces against trees and stone walls the danger which was always attached to the landing of airships has led some to suggest that they should never be brought to earth but moored in mid-air as large ships anchor in midstream it is suggested that tall towers be built to the top of which the ship be attached by a cable so arranged that she will always float to the leeward of the tower the passengers would be landed by gangplanks and taken up and down the towers and elevators kipling suggests this expedient in his prophetic sketch with the night mail the airship would only return to earth as a ship goes into dry dock when in need of repairs a curious mishap that threatened for a time to wreck the peace of the world occurred in april nineteen thirteen when a german zeppelin was forced out of its course and over french territory the right of alien machines to pass over their territory is jealously guarded by european nations and during the progress of the great war the dutch repeatedly protested against the violation of their atmosphere by german aviators at the time of this mischance however france and germany were at peace or as nearly so as racial and historic antipathies would permit accordingly when officers of a brigade of french cavalry engaged in maneuvering near the great fortress of luneville saw a shadow moving across the field and looking up saw a huge zeppelin betwixt themselves and the sun they were astonished and alarmed signs and faint shouts from the aeronauts appeared to indicate that their errand was at least friendly if not involuntary the soldiers stopped their drill the townspeople trooped out to the champ de mars where the phenomenon was exhibited and began excitedly discussing this suspicious invasion word was speedily sent to military headquarters asking whether to welcome or to repel the foe
Meantime, the great ship was drifting perilously near the housetops, and the uniformed officers in the cars began making signals to the soldiers below. Ropes were thrown out, seized by willing hands, and made fast. The crew of Germans descended to find themselves prisoners. The international law was clear enough. The ship was a military engine of the German army. Its officers, all in uniform, had deliberately steered her into the very heart of a French fortress. Though the countries were at peace, the act was technically one of war, an armed invasion by the enemy. Diplomacy, of course, settled the issue peacefully, but not before the French had made careful drawings of all the essential features of the Zeppelin, and taken copies of its log. As Germany had theretofore kept a rigid secrecy about all the details of Zeppelin construction and operation, this angered the military authorities beyond measure. The unlucky officers who had shared in the accident were savagely told that they should have blown the ship up in mid-air and perished with it, rather than to have weakly submitted it to French inspection. They suffered court-martial, but escaped with severe reprimands. The story of the dirigibles of France and Germany is practically the whole story of the development to a reasonable degree of perfection of the lighter-than-air machine. Other nations experimented somewhat, but in the main lagged behind these pioneers. Out of Spain indeed came a most efficient craft, the Astra Torres, of which the British government had the best example prior to the war, while both France and Russia placed large orders with the builders. How many finally went into service, and what may have been their record, are facts veiled in the secrecy of wartime. Belgium and Italy both produced dirigibles of distinctive character. The United States is alone at the present moment in having contributed nothing to the improvement of the dirigible balloon. Chapter 4, Part 2 of End of and the Count von Zeppelin by Willis Part J. Two. Abbott. This recording, recording by William is in the public Co. domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Count von Zeppelin, Part 2. The worrisome work of begging began again, but this time the Kaiser's aid was even more effectively given 